We'll be getting started in about one more minute. You're up here. You're up here. Claudia, you're up here. How are you, Mr. Adams? Hey, Michael, how are you doing? Is a name for Мне так легче выразить свои мысли. Хотя могу Chairman, Tea Chairman, moderator. Why are you not chairman? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I listen to you? No, we don't have Michael Fole. Huh? Michael Fole is not here. Uh, Mike Fole? I have not seen him, no? Leroy, you know, Mike's not here, so. It's the future, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was in the GTA Beijing last week. I didn't see him. 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 One in the triple seven with a drum kit. I just see him. Two days. Okay. And back home. Oh, Brother, got oh, your name. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we have both not here. So I don't know. Uh, we should have your name. <laughs> we are happy or not happy? <laughs> or we are so happy. <laughs> what you want to do? <laughs> we are know. so happy. Reflection. <laughs> it is reflection. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
That's better. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Uh, we have uh, an international crew panel here assembled uh, in front of uh, the group. And uh, I think all these individuals have a, a great deal of time and space. They also have flown with uh, astronauts and cosmonauts from other countries and in a number of cases have flown both uh, American and Russian spacecraft. And uh, let me introduce them. Uh, Jean-Luc Chrétien, uh, the first European astronaut and flew with the Russians and has flown with the, the, on the space shuttle as well and been up to the uh, Russian space station Mir and probably uh, has a record of being the first uh, astronaut that flew or flew and played a uh, organ in orbit so <laughs> Michael Fink has also been up on the shuttle and uh, also in the station and uh, Leroy as well and uh, Michael Michael Lopez Allegre and Vladimir Titov who's been up in space for over a year and uh, flown on the Russian space station also flown on the shuttle Michelle Toganini who's flown with Russia and also in the space shuttle and Koichi Wakata, who is uh, flown on the station and also on the shuttle. So I think this, crew, uh, this crew of people here in front of you, are, they're eminently well qualified to, to talk about uh, crew size and also all the issues that relate to uh, uh, six-person versus three-person crews and crew composition guidelines and uh, rotation times and anything to do with the, the crew and the resources on board the station. So. Uh, I'll turn it over to John Liu, and you can start off and just go down the line. Okay, and I, I hope we'll continue after a, a few words, but at least for me, we'll be at the beginning because I don't know exactly how to start the first one. Uh, only to mention that after what has been said here for these past uh, two days and two and a half days, no, yeah, two days. Um, we know that the future is quite uncertain for uh, the crews. And uh, the next way to go to space, and with the announcement that was made uh, six months ago and prepared by the Augustine Commission, there is a lot of uh, unknown, uh, a lot of unknown stuff. And uh, what we know is that we need, we need to make money in space. Uh, we are not expecting any more money from uh, the administration. I mean, we're expecting less and less money from administrations, not only NASA, but uh, also all other administrations. And uh, something will happen, uh, need to happen if uh, we still want to talk about crews in space, crew dimensions. And uh, one example for, one thing for example here, uh, six person versus three-person crew, crew composition guidelines. Uh, I personally think that one day we'll see a space vehicle being like an airliner, like in commercial aviation. So the crew will be as small as possible and the cargo will be very big because again, we want to make money. So uh, talking about six persons and a crew member, what about the rest? Who is the rest? Is the rest uh, the cargo, is it uh, passengers, is that uh, businessmen that we carry on board and that will pay a lot of money to come? And uh, this is a big picture and I think uh, that's what we are waiting for and uh, in the next 10 years a lot will, uh, will happen. And, uh, and the last point, last thing I want to point out is that uh, working for a small company here in Houston, I heard, I know what's a small uh, disadvantage business act is and uh, when big companies had to pay back to small companies some of the money they make and uh, once we have heard that uh, the, the big companies that will get contracts by NASA for the future and uh, probably will make money through those contracts why don't we already get prepared to ask those companies to repay back um, part of the, their benefits for the manned space program so that at least we can already say um, the manned space program is using not only the money from the taxpayer, but also the money of the benefits of the big one. 
and then we can talk about uh, all those questions. But right now, I have no no answers to uh, those points other than uh, this one. Michael, I'd like to uh, start out by uh, thanking uh, Bill Thompson up there uh, for his spider story. I was that guy. Uh, who <laughs> so thanks for pointing out my uh, lack of knowledge in uh, ar arachnid science. I'll tell a little bit more about that uh, story really quickly, and then uh, we can get into details. But uh, the the first web that uh, the spider built was looked like the spider had uh, drunk too much cognac or something, and it was quite uh, disorganized. But it was really amazing to see the next day uh, that the spider uh, ate up its own web and then uh, 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 made a constructed a really beautiful web afterwards. And it was you know it was a classic beautiful Charlotte's web kind of. Uh, web. It was it was uh, perfectly symmetrical and beautiful, and it shows how amazing life is. Not just human life in space, but you know the, the life is really adaptable, and it de definitely did capture our imagination as well as the imagination of uh, all the uh, you know children, school teachers, and the rest. And that's what our space station really does. It it, it it's a tool that's uh, very inspirational, and uh, but it uh, doesn't magically just happen that way, but. Uh, the reason why it is inspirational is because we haven't had too many bad stories. What I mean bad stories were, were is that our countermeasures system seemed to have been working. I've had a, the privilege of flying aboard the space station for over a year uh, on, on two separate missions. <coughs> and uh, I'm here today, I uh, feel very healthy, and uh, we have the medical data to prove it up, uh, to prove that. Our countermeasure systems have been uh, working really well. I've been, uh, I had the privilege of, of constructing or reconstructing, I guess, the advanced resistive exercise device, our new gym on, on board. And uh, you could look at the bone data from my first mission and my second mission, and you could see that there was a striking difference. And uh, so we're, 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 we, this community, has uh, figured out a lot of things that are going to make a difference uh, for the future. Our quarantine system seems very basic <coughs> you know, for anybody who studied public health. Uh, yet it seems to be working. We, we have not had any serious illnesses that I know of uh, aboard the space station. People are staying healthy, even though uh, you can argue that our immune systems are compromised. Um, and the medical standards that that you know, make sure that we're healthy before we fly, so that we don't get, uh, you know, so that we don't run into medical issues while we're up there, have seemed to be working out really well. Also, I mean, the space station isn't something you know not new that we keep looking forward to the future. We have you know many years of solid data. Uh, of, of flying healthy and successfully so that we can get our mission done. Uh, one thing that we that is going to come up uh, is that we, you know, now that the station is uh, a long-term investment in our future, and we're going to have more and more people repeating missions. Uh, uh, three Americans of us have uh, had a chance to fly, fly at least twice uh, long-duration missions. There's going to be more, of course. Our Russian Soviet colleagues have had uh, have quite a bit. And uh, all of our other international partners are going to be flying, uh, uh, you know, again and again. And we're going to run into uh, the radiation limits, and we need to understand how, as a community, we can um, qualify and quantify and see if there's any countermeasures for radiation. So, if you were to ask me what my, you know, one of the personal things that uh, I think that we could be working on, it's uh, how to how to work on radiation uh, protection as well as countermeasures, as well as uh, you know what are our true limits that a human being can take. I mean, we already have people that have, have you know, six or 800 days in space, and, you know, the American record right now is, you know, just over a year. So there's, there's uh, things that we need to, as a community, to understand more. And, of course, this has direct applicability to any time we leave low Earth orbit and go, go beyond when we're not uh, protected by our, uh, our uh, magnetosphere. So that's something that uh, I'm glad to hear that we've been talking about, about here. Uh, also, uh, the space station. I really want to leave with the uh, leave the impression that the space station is uh, a great place to do science. I mean, we have uh, capability of six people on board right now. Um, there's uh, and this, the crew has plenty of time to get science done. Uh, we don't always make it sound that way when uh, and NASA's uh, you know the way that the negotiations work out for crew time. But I assure you, uh, you know, we, were, we, we love science so much. My crews, we were doing science on the weekends. Whenever we you know, had time, we were volunteering because some of the stuff that we have is really 
uh, important, and we understand that, and we're you know, we're working hard with six people. It's gonna it's gonna be amazing. So what we need from the community is real amounts of really important science that can uh, help out, and then uh, that's gonna uh, we don't have enough of that right now. And I know there's two sides to every story. Uh, there's different stories that you hear about you know, not enough crew time, and and uh, and also our processes seem to be. And again, I'm only at the very tip of the uh, the iceberg, if you will. Uh, the, uh, it takes a long time to get any kind of um, science on board the space station and to get any kind of results. And so I applaud you all for your patience, and I encourage everybody on this team to uh, continue pushing the system to make it more efficient so that it doesn't take five <coughs> or six years, because uh, that's uh, beyond most people's attention span to get, uh, to get some uh, science aboard space station. So uh, yeah, so we have six people on board now, which was our goal. Uh, we have uh, plenty of power. We have uh, enthusiastic crew members and excellent people to, to, to help train us. And you all are bringing the science to the table. And uh, it's, it's gonna be some, some great discoveries in, in the future. So we're looking forward to uh, continue our international cooperation together. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Leroy? Yeah, I'd like to start just uh, <coughs> by saying thank you to you you folks in the space biomedicine community for all the work that you do to help keep us flyers safe and healthy when we're flying uh, these missions. Over my 15 years at NASA, I was very fortunate to have a very rich flying career. Uh, I got to fly three times on space shuttle. Uh, got to fly once on Soyuz going up and down as a co-pilot. Got to be the commander of the station. I got to perform six spacewalks, four in the American suit and two in the, uh, the Russian suit. And through all of that, all of your work has helped keep me healthy. Um, you know, m one of the things that struck me when I was getting ready to go fly my long flight is I had accumulated 30 some odd days of experience in space prior to you know, launching aboard Soyuz to go for the six and a half month flight. And so I thought I had a pretty good idea and I could kind of extrapolate to what that experience would be like. And let me tell you what, boy was I wrong. You know, if you're, if you uh, haven't flown a long duration flight or worked on a long duration flight, it's uh, different as night and day. And uh, the lessons learned that we uh, take from each flight uh, is going to pertain to different parts of, or different flight regimes as we go forward. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me was, you know, one of the topics here is three versus six crew. Well, I was up there uh, on the station for a long duration flight during a unique time where we only had a crew of two. And of course, there, were, there was a short, you know, temporary crew of five during crew exchange. But uh, for the long haul, it was just uh, Salajan Sharipov and me. And uh, Salajan was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, he had a, a problem getting his visa and he wasn't able to come. But I think he'd tell you the same thing I did, that, uh, that, I, that I will, and that is a crew of two is a unique dynamic. Um, we got along very well. I called Salajan the brother I never had. And, you know, we're both pretty easygoing people. And we worked, you know, kind of more or less in segmented ops. You know, he was working most of the day in the Russian segment with the Russian Mission Control Center. I was working most of the day in the uh, US, USOS, working with MCC Houston. And we'd come together at meal times and, uh, you know, talk about how things were going. And so we had a very smooth, very, very, uh, very good flight. And I think the dynamic changes when you add three. When you go to a crew of three, and you can, some of these guys can tell you, uh, I think automatically, just like on the ground, a group of three people, you're going to have two people that are kind of closer than uh, with the third person. So you automatically get a 2v1 situation. And then uh, that dynamic, of course, is going to change again if you add more people to the mix. So now we've got a crew of six on board, and I think it's uh, uh, something that needs to be studied more. Uh, I know the Russians have done a lot of work because they've been flying long duration flights longer than we have on the crew dynamics, psycho psychological, social effects, and, and things like that. And of course, a lot of the uh, uh, analog studies are done and, and the data from those studies are very useful for us to project how we're going to go do a long duration flight uh, to Mars or, or to another destination. Um, let's see, one of the things that I want to comment on is, is some of the things that are coming out now from the commercial versus the exploration side. And I think it's important to keep in focus that those are two separate things. The commercial things that are being talked about are inherently short duration. That is the, uh, the NASA, uh, the ideas of, of farming out low Earth orbit access to the commercial guys, that's basically taxi service to and from low Earth orbit, to and from the, the ISS, doing crew transfer and things like that. And that's going to be a separate list of requirements and things that are important, just as I found out during my flight experience. 
Uh, NASA's, NASA's charter is going to be go out and develop the spacecraft and operations for exploration beyond LEO, and by definition, therefore, uh, being long duration, in addition to the existing space station missions, all the uh, beyond LEO explorations are going to be long duration. So those are a whole different set of problems. So I think there's a lot of work to be done going forward, and I think it's important to decide or figure out what your proposal is going to cover. Uh, are you going to go after the short duration problems where maybe exercise isn't that important, or are you going to go after the long duration stuff? And I'd just like to comment one thing on, on what Mike said. The uh, exercise uh, does seem to prevent, or, you know, except for the radiation, it seemed to, uh, seems to prevent a lot of the, the maladies that can come from long duration space flight. Uh, I can tell you personally, my medical data, uh, I experienced immeasurable bone loss coming back from a six and a half month flight, and that was using the IRED, the low resistance, relatively low resistance exercise device, as well as the, um, the bicycle, of course, and the treadmill for the cardiovascular. And the reason I bring that up is, as you're all aware, there have been some uh, strange medical problems that have come up recently that we believe is due to uh, an increase in intracranial pressure. Uh, and one hypothesis is perhaps the, the new exercise equipment, the AREd, uh, using the higher resistance, that could be causing uh, or at least be contributing to this problem. And so at least for an, a data point of one, which I know is statistically insignificant, uh, and I know some of my friends I've talked to also had this experience, but if you're working out with a lower resistance and higher repetitions, that seems also to be efficacious. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Lior. Michael? Thanks, Mr. Abbey. I, first of all, it's an honor for me to be in this room, not just with the uh, August audience, but also with my colleagues up here who truly represent a, a wealth of uh, international spaceflight experience. So thank you for the kind invitation. Um, as looking at this uh, long list of topics that we have, and uh, my flight background is quite similar to Leroy's. I also flew on three shuttle flights and then uh, up and down on Soyuz for a seven-month stay on the space station. And before I talk about sort of reflections on the flight part of it, I'd like to address a couple of the things um, wearing my current hat, which is um, in flight crew operations, and I guess most importantly, as a NASA representative on the multilateral crew operations panel. So the question about uh, crew uh, makeup and selection criteria is a pretty interesting one. Um, <clears throat> first of all, as we divide the seats, uh, which you can assume now we have a crew of six, it'll stay that way for a while, uh, between the various partners, um, first of all, the Russian Roscosmos has an allocation of 50% of those seats, and then the other 50% are divided basically based on a contribution uh, as put out in an intergovernmental agreement at the beginning of the program between the Russian, uh, I'm sorry, the Europeans, the Canadians, and the Japanese. So <coughs> the way we do crew rotation these days is we have uh, two what we call lines of the Soyuz, uh, the A line and the B line. The A line launches and lands basically in say March, April, and September, October on six month centers. And the B line does the same thing about two months later. So we just launched uh, the 22 Soyuz uh, in March, and we are about to launch the 23 Soyuz here in June. So the A line always has the same crew composition. It has two Russians and one American. In the Soyuz, there is a commander, a flight engineer, and a flight engineer too. On that A line, the commander is always uh, the, a Russian, as is the flight engineer. <coughs> And then Flight Engineer 2 is always a NASA crew member. So the interesting line, you might say, is the B line, where there's a lot more going on. On that line, the center seat, the commander seat, is always a Russian. But the left and right seats can be either NASA or any of the other IPs. And that decision is made basically by looking at the roster and who's available, um, who has the most experience, or sometimes it's the desire of the agency to try to get that kind of experience as a flight engineer for the left seater. The left seater is generally uh, more challenging, a longer training flow, more time spent away from home, usually a higher language level requirement to speak Russian. So we manage all that in the uh, multilateral crew operations panel and in fact Michel Tonini is a European representative so if I get the answer wrong I'm sure he'll be able to help me. Um, uh, th the other interesting part of that though is that when you talk about the uh, guidelines for crew selection there are a lot of things that we put out as um, desired attributes. So we'd like to have somebody with, let's say, a certain language level. 
We'd like to have somebody that has uh, EVA capability. We always like to send people out in pairs, one of whom has always done, has done an EVA before. We'd like to have a certain amount of um, what we call behavioral health uh, experience and training. So when we have uh, situations on board that you know, might test your patients, you have some tools to deal with those things. The fact of the matter is that the rosters that we have are fairly limited. Uh, the IPs, uh, even more so, I when I say IPs, I mean the Canadians, Japanese, and, uh, and Europeans. Uh, there aren't that many um, people to choose from, um, especially the Europeans have political pressures that they have to deal with to make uh, their <coughs> member states happy. So the message I'm trying to get to you is that sometimes we can't say, well, we'd like to, we can't put the people that we'd like to put in there, or let me say it differently, a person w that has all the attributes we'd like to put in there. So we have to put people who A, volunteer, and B, are medically qualified, and that's a pretty small list of folks. So th the second, that segues into the second thing, which is standardized crew, tr crew training, and, and we have done a, a fantastic job uh, not the crew office, but the uh, training folks, uh, both at NASA Johnson Space Center, but also at the training sites around uh, the world to make a very streamlined, very efficient uh, training flow that is down to about two and a half years. After two years, a crew of three is ready to fly as a backup, but ostensibly as a prime if, if that were to be necessary, and then nominally they would fly six months later. <laughs> Uh, when I first started training, the training flows were on the order of four years, so it's quite an improvement from them until now. Um, I'd like to transition to one more topic, and that is to uh, disagree with my esteemed colleague Leroy here, <laughs> and that is that he, he's right, he had a crew of two, and um, I think I would have felt likewise that going to a, a crew of three would be, uh, you'd always have sort of that polarizing effect. Um, I was fortunate enough to fly the first half of my mission with uh, a Russian and a German, and the second half with uh, that same Russian and an American. And I, I guess uh, what's most interesting to me, because often I'm asked the question, you know, how is it living in a tin can for six months, et cetera? You know, you can't yell at each other. You can't just take a walk outside. And um, I attribute the fact that it works to a couple of things. First, uh, we, get, we do get some training. We have a, a part of our syllabus and the training uh, flow is to do some exercises that have um, sort of induced or built-in stressors to make you sort of make you uncomfortable and those stressors generally provoke some sort of uh, conflict which requires resolution. It gives you some tools that you're better equipped to deal with that when it might, should it happen in space. Uh, secondly, I think when you go into something like this, whether you know it or not, your organism tells you, hey, this is going to be tough. Um, maybe you should raise your threshold a bit before you fly off the handle, something like that. And third, I'd have to say is flat out luck. Um, I, the, the folks that I flew with were, like Leroy said, brothers and sister to me. It, it's, a, it's a difficult um, thing to anticipate, but it just worked fabulously. And there was none of that polarization, which I would have predicted. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear what Koichi has to say. I think he's the only one at the table who's flown with six people on board. Um, but for three people, it's fantastic. Lastly, to close, uh, I just want to say that the international nature of this whole thing is, uh, I think, the biggest legacy that the station program will leave with. And I'm not trying to diminish the importance of the science, but when you think about what we've done, uh, both in terms of hardware, putting together what's up there right now, orbiting with six people aboard, but more importantly, uh, the meetings, the uh, discussions, the arm wrestling sometimes that goes on between the partners to make things work. I think it's a real testimony to what can be done in the spirit of uh, international cooperation. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Vladimir. Yeah. Who, speak e to, who does, doesn't speak English, <coughs> please uh, use units, uh, translation <laughs> units. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> uh, 
My opinion on the different crew sizes is as follows. I had a privilege of flying as part of a two-person crew, three-person crew, six-person crew, and ten-person crew. And I can tell you that it's much easier to work with the or to govern the crew of two people than a crew of ten people. Um, secondly, when we have a lot of people on board the station, then the commander has to make decisions. Maybe these decisions have to be made on the ground about creating certain subgroups, and each one of these subgroups has to be commanded by somebody. Because everybody who works in administration knows that when a number of people working exceeds a certain number, it's very hard to maneuver it or to guide it. In 1988, we had a great opportunity when we flew in a matter for eight months as a two-person crew, then three-person crew, and then one month as a six-person crew. And then Dr. Polikov stayed with the next crew for two, three months. So the experience that was gained by people who talked to us was then imparted to the next crew. And right now, I no longer work at the GCTC, but I talk to the cosmonauts, and I, I see the following. Uh, this rule continues to be used, the rule of imparting the experience of one crew to another. In terms of scheduling the work day or work week, etc., this is something so flexible that it's all, it always forces us to resolve issues on how to replan our activities or redirect the crew time to perform other work. And it's important for the crew to be prepared for that. It is important that because if a person decides to do a certain type of activity and then he has to change his plans, oftentimes it leads to irritability and anger, maybe. So it has negative effects. But these are psychological questions, maybe um, questions that can be addressed by space psychology. Yesterday was a very interesting discussion that turned out to be very long about the duration of the flight, what would be optimum time, what would be not so optimal. And I think that ha this issue has to be subdivided into two. First question is the duration of flight on the ISS. In this particular case, the optimum solution is made and the optimum duration of that expedition is chosen. Uh, in my view, half a year that has been established for now uh, was adopted from the purely technical point of view because um, half a year is exactly was uh, driven by the propellant component, the fuel component that is used in the control system that is used for landing. Uh, do Orbiting. This uh, component was not uh, did not have the capability to operate over 180 days, and that was the constraint that was a, that applied to the flight. So the general designer said, "We're not going to build a vehicle just for you personally that uses less fuel. We have spent a certain amount of money. It's going to fly as long as we designed it to fly." And so for today, all the organizations ha have standardized that particular uh, duration. 
duration, and they have geared their all their activities and their schedules to that timeline. But these are two different issues because this is not a timeline that is optimum for a human being. Um, I'll give you one example. You know the, um, the Limal uh, car races, 24 hours, extreme car race at extreme velocities with the extreme attention from the pilot. Um, when, the dri when do the drivers start crashing? Uh, I talked to the team lead. When do you replace the drivers? He said in two hours. Uh, because they start crashing in two hours. They start making errors. Uh, they achieve a physiological uh, limit of their psychological um, system, and their settings no longer work. Uh, yes, you can make a pilot to drive for four or six uh, hours, but there is no guarantee that he is not going to make an error and not crash a car and, uh, and is not going to do damage to himself. Um, and the same happens in other areas when a person arrives, uh, when a person comes to activity at critical um, uh, limits. What is, the, what is the limit for humans right now? Uh, we have to understand what does it does the human breathe, how does he or she eat, uh, what is his, his physical state in flight, how is the person prepared to landing, and how is the person uh, prepared for rehabilitation, restoration of activities, normal activities. Uh, for example, I have flown for about a year. Uh, by the way, um, as far as the data confidentiality or, non or lack thereof, uh, let's Let's say if, if I had swelling of ankles after after flight, after one year long flight, I still have swelling in ankles. If I had increased um, erythrocyte uh, count in my blood, I still have it. It's still the same. I don't know whether it's a good thing or not, and nobody can explain it to me. If it's a good thing, that's fine, but then there has to be some explanation. But if it's a bad thing, then what does it mean? Is that a normal uh, response of the world? organism, or maybe it could be preventable, maybe there are some remedies to prevent that, or if it's abnormal, then it has to be treated. So therefore, the questions arise, do we select the time correctly? Uh, I know for sure that three or four months is when people will be working, landing, and then in another three or four months, they'll be ready to fly back again. And uh, whether it's uh, economically justified or not, uh, it's a it's a separate issue, but whether the person is capable of doing that is another question, too. A human being has other uh, goals and tasks, family and his own personal uh, priorities. So here is how the flights are uh, divided, the long-duration flight. It's a rec let's say it's a record flight. Are we ready for those missions? Well. Uh, if they offered me to fly that mission, I didn't have too many doubts because I have chosen that job and uh, um, it was necessary and I was curious myself and at the same time, uh, I didn't think too much about the consequences at that moment. For instance, the fighter pilots uh, who experience extreme loads are not too concerned about 9G accelerations every day. But aviation medicine has taken care of that, and there is a constraint that you can only have three uh, sorties per day. Um, and uh, in the same uh, vain medical space medicine should work out its own criteria in the well that's probably everything thank you very much for your attention and i'm ready to answer your questions well, thank you um, so today we have many astronauts uh, around the table and you can see that we have people from uh, from the five partners i mean from the five partners participating to the space station we have even uh, China uh, listening to us. I hope that a Chinese astronaut will come on this table on the next symposium next year. And um, all that to tell that uh, when um, we discussed the space station uh, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, many people uh, told us this space station will never exist. Cooperation will <coughs> never work and it will not happen. 
and I started to do my, my business with this ID, and I have to, to recognize that uh, it belongs to us, to all of us, and uh, I have to recognize uh, George because he, he pushed a lot on the cooperation with, with Russia at the time where you were with NASA, and I see that you're, you're pushing a lot with the Chinese as well. So it belongs to us to, to, to make this cooperation happening. If, um, <laughs> if some of us have uh, an idea which is uh, going against the cooperation, it will not happen and it will destroy everything. So we did uh, something which is very visible and I can tell you that in Europe, the, the, the most important success of the space station is not that we do uh, the great science on the space station, but because we are internationally uh, linked to one project which is really visible and really uh, sophisticated. And uh, even the politicians in Europe are paying a lot of attention to the space station because of this international factor of the space station. And I'm sure that if, if we include in the future more countries like uh, China or like India, it would be even better. So it brings to the space station the fact that um, um, it's, it's uh, the best best and uh, the most economical test bed for going further. Further could be the moon, could be Mars. In fact, uh, what is the goal of this exploration going to the moon or Mars is not so important today. What is important is the path. It's like uh, if you have heard uh, the story of people doing the pèlerinage in Saint Jacques de Compostelle, the most important is to start your, your pèlerinage to go there. And we are doing our path to exploration by the space station. And whatever we do, we will need to have a space station to transfer from low Earth orbit to the moon orbit or to the Mars orbit. So what, what all the job we do on the space station in terms of uh, international relationship, in terms of panel, in terms of discussion, in terms of medical control that you are doing now with us, all that is a solid basis for the future. And you, there, there is no time constraint for the future, but this will happen on this way. What is it so important is we also, we always speak about what is the return uh, on investment of the space station for people on Earth. The return on investment for me, the most visible one is the research and development that we do, but the research results that are coming back to people on Earth. If we invent new, uh, new items or new uh, computer or new processes or new uh, alloy in space, they will benefit to humankind. And this is coming from the research we are doing. So whatever the goal is, the research will come and will benefit people on, 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 uh, on Earth. Also, um, uh, we, we told this morning that uh, one very important factor of collaboration and cooperation is the trust. The trust is the fact that we build the trust step by step, year after year. And this is why we need to have this cooperation uh, lasting in, uh, in a long term without coming back at any time to a position which is uh, that we had earlier. So we need to always process, always um, consolidate this cooperation in a good way. And sometimes if we have a conflict uh, with one partner, trying to solve this conflict the best possible way. And I can tell you that uh, as Mike said, we are on the MCOP, which is a multilateral cooperational panel. All the issues that we have are solved nicely and efficiently. And so far, all the crews that have been in space have been working very well. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Thank you Michel. Koichi. It's my honor to be uh, able to be here with uh, uh, my crewmates here. And uh, I'm from Japanese Space Agency, JAXA. And I had opportunities to fly on the shuttle a couple of times. And uh, last year, I flew on a long duration flight uh, to the station. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, every country has uh, uh, political issues and also budgetary problems uh, of the extension of the International Space Station, but I think we are pretty much in agreement to, to expand this operation to 2020, and uh, each country is working towards that, and I uh, hope uh, every uh, partner of the International Space Station will agree uh, in this government level. Because now that we have uh, six crew members on board, uh, we have full capability to utilize the wonderful asset of the station. This is the largest ever uh, science and technology uh, international cooperative project, and I, we have established this uh, foundation to, to, uh, to, to do this uh, wonderful science uh, 
by the uh, International Space Station. And when we go beyond the low Earth orbit, uh, this cooperative basis uh, will, uh, uh, will boost us uh, towards our new goal. Um, beyond the station, I think we need to provide a clear goal uh, to, to all the partners of, uh, of the International uh, Space Station and also beyond, uh, as Michelle mentioned, uh, uh, China, India, other uh, space uh, uh, developing uh, countries, uh, we will I would like to work with as many uh, people uh, as, uh, as we can see. And uh, I was uh, fortunate to be able to work in the two different stages of the International Space Station, three crew member stage and the six crew member stage. Um, there was a significant difference between three and six. Uh, when we had the three crew members on board the station, pretty close to two people needed to be allocated for uh, housekeeping and maintenance work of the International Space Station. So only the additional about one person was able to do uh, science. But now we have six crew members on board. We can fully utilize the uh, station. And uh, in the U.S., uh, in many countries, uh, uh, emphasis of utilization of the space station is uh, mainly towards the science and engineering. And uh, in Japan, uh, on the other hand, it's a little bit uh, different because we somehow cherish more on the cultural aspect <laughs> of utilization of space. So uh, uh, we, as a payload, we conducted a lot of uh, science, not only the science and engineering related uh, uh, experiments, but also art, like uh, poems and uh, taking pictures of the moon and uh, making a, a digitized that the image and to make a song or a music out of the pictures and stuff like that. So uh, it's uh, very important for the Japanese government to show the public and the government officials to, to, to uh, make them understand that we are trying to utilize the station uh, as much as we can, not only in, in one limited field, but also uh, uh, in the variety of field uh, to justify the expenditure of the International Space Station. Right now, uh, <coughs> for the uh, long duration space flight in space, uh, we have some medical uh, challenges that we have to uh, 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 get over with. Uh, I'm sure many of uh, here are specialized in the medical field, and uh, Dr. Kashimada mentioned it to me earlier, but uh, um, like radiation exposure and the bone loss and also um, temporary or uh, longer uh, vision loss due to uh, uh, intracranial pressure uh, that is occurring, and those are the things that we have to get over with it. But uh, as far as bone loss, I think we are pretty close to resolving the problem. Um, exercise device, uh, new resistive exercise device is, uh, is a contributing factor. And also I was uh, one of the guinea pigs of uh, new uh, medication called bisphosphonate uh, alendronate that is uh, medication for osteoporosis. And uh, with one person's data, it doesn't have any significance in science, but uh, I did not lose any bone loss, actually bone uh, density. Actually, uh, as a matter of fact, I increased my pelvis increased by five percent, and the bone, uh, my backbone increased by about ten percent. So, it's a uh, it's amazing how much we have improved in this uh, field of uh, uh, countermeasures against the bone loss. Uh, <coughs> and uh, when we go to Mars, I talked with uh, uh, my uh, commander uh, Gennady Ivanovich uh, Padalka. It'll be difficult. Uh, not to be able to see the blue planet uh, for extended period of time. Of course, we will have a lot of work to do once we go to Mars, but uh, on our way and back between the two planets, uh, we have to spend some time without uh, being able to see the beautiful blue planet. And it's very important psychologically to have uh, adequate amount of work. Once we go to Mars, we have a lot to do. But uh, in between, uh, we need to make ourselves busy with uh, additional experiments. Sixth crew member stage was also very busy, and uh, it was very important for us to have uh, a lot of min min uh, meaningful work. And uh, for psychological uh, stability, uh, since we cannot uh, go out to play tennis or golf or anything, Meal time was very important. Gennady Ivanovich uh, emphasized that uh, we six crew members uh, get together as much as we can for three meals, as much as we can, depending on the busyness of the experiment and other tasks. But uh, by uh, w uh, getting together for meal opportunities and then to have good communication between the crew members, that was uh, one of the most important things to have this uh, stability in the uh, uh, 
uh, in the psychological stage of the, the crew members. And uh, Gennady was able to tell us that because of his uh, more than 500 days of uh, stay on the orbit, and I learned a lot. But again, uh, communication between the crew members as well as the uh, communication between the crew members and uh, mission control centers are very important. And uh, I uh, would like to have uh, maybe Bob's opinion, who uh, I flew with uh, uh, on the space station as an expedition uh, 20 crew member. Actually, we needed to have a little bigger table here, but. Uh. Thanks, Koichi. Uh, these are all really good topics here for the International Crew Panel. I think for the sake of time, I'll just talk on about two or three of them here. Uh, first of all, six-person versus three-person crew. I have the opportunity to be part of a six-person crew <coughs> when uh, my two Soyuz crewmates and I arrived uh, on the station last uh, May 29th. Uh, the station transitioned to six-person at that time. And, of course, the, the big benefits, as uh, Mike has already mentioned, is the science output. So you're probably interested in that. In uh, our... Uh, Expedition 20 alone, we were on there for 20 and 21. Uh, we performed over 100 experiments and uh, over 1,000 crew hours of time were devoted to, um, to science, as opposed to the previous uh, six-month uh, increments where typically 100, 150 uh, crew hours of science uh, were, were of crew hours were, were completed. So that's the main uh, benefit. Uh, the other benefit, I guess, is that with six people up there, if someone gets behind in a task, there's always someone else on board who's available to help that person uh, get caught back up to speed and, and complete the, the project uh, properly. Uh, for you as um, flight surgeons and as scientists, there are some other impacts of six-person crew that you should be aware of. Um, I guess first of all is the space-to-ground comm. There's only two space-to-ground comm lines right now. And with six people up there, you could theoretically have uh, six people up there doing six different activities that should puts quite a strain on the flight control team on the ground and also the comm lines as well. Two comm lines is not adequate. Uh, typically, Space to Ground 1 was devoted to um, the Russian segment activities and Space to Ground 2 to the USOS. And there were several times when uh, I was waiting for access to a, to a comm line to talk to the, um, to the ground. So I recommend that we pursue uh, three or four comm lines in, um, in the future. Um, I guess the other thing is timelining as, as well. Uh, with six member crews, we need to be careful about uh, scheduling. Uh, there are some activities on our schedule which are indicated as time critical, so they have to be done at that moment in time. Other activities such as exercise do not necessarily, but in actual fact, they do need to be done according to the timeline. If I'm on an exercise machine and someone else is planning their day and they're planning to, to uh, start their exercise exactly as timeline, well, I don't have the liberty to start my exercise or end my exercise 15 or, or 30 minutes late, so we have to be a little bit uh, more disciplined about that. The timeliners are pretty good about um, avoiding spatial conflicts of our activities in the station, but sometimes we ran into problems of SSCs. SSCs are the laptop computers that give us access to our, to the LAN, to the uh, procedures, and um, to some of our social, uh, psychosocial tools as well. And sometimes there was a conflict over access to SSCs, so that's something we'll have to watch out for in the future. Uh, crew composition, I heard uh, Mike uh, make some really good points about crew composition. Uh, there are often cases where programmatic or political reasons put crews together rather than um, you know, interpersonal synergy, but it wasn't an issue for us. Uh, I agree with Koichi. We had a tremendous experience with six people up there, and um, we are not just colleagues now, the, the five people that I flew with, but we're, uh, we're best friends now as well. We represented a spectrum of ideologies, a spectrum of religi religious beliefs, a spectrum of political beliefs, but it wasn't an issue. <coughs> uh, I think astronaut selection has something to do with that. Uh, you know, the psychological criteria are getting more weight these days with long duration space flight upon us. And also uh, we do something called expeditionary training as well. A part of our training program is to help us develop these self-care, self-management, teamwork, group living and leadership skills which uh, are very good skills to help us uh, avoid conflicts and work uh, with synergy on, on orbit. Uh, maybe just one or two more things. Uh, crew schedules. Uh, I remember on the evening of docking day, uh, May 29th of last year, we had a dinner together and Gennady Padelka, our um, uh, very experienced commander, asked me, he said, so Bob, what's the difference between a shuttle flight and a, and a space station flight? And I said, well, a shuttle flight's a sprint, and a space station expedition is a marathon. He said, not quite. He said, <coughs> there's only one difference. He said, a uh, shuttle flight, 
is a short duration flight with a frantic, hectic work pace. And a space station expedition is a long duration flight with a frantic, hectic work pace. <laughs> That's, that's the only dish, uh, difference, and I spent six months uh, <laughs> learning that, that lesson. Uh, so I think the analogy is better, maybe a sprint compared to a Tour de France, because it's um, pacing oneself is something that um, is very important. I think we paced ourselves quite well. Um, I, I remember shortly after arriving in space, I talked to um, Roman Romanenko, and um, Roman would say, wow, we've been in space for seven days now. I can't believe they're paying us to do this. And then the same thing after 30 days, bop, we've been in space for one month now. This is fantastic stuff. And I noticed a change. <laughs> About 40 days to go, Roman would say, bop, only 40 more days to go. <laughs> Actually, he didn't measure it in terms of days. He measure, measured it in terms of toilet ops. He, di he didn't say toilet, he had another word for toilet ops. Only, f <laughs> only 40 more toilet ops to go. <laughs> So there, there is a, there's de definitely a, a change, um, and we have to be very careful as crew members to pace ourselves, and you as um, scientists and medical doctors and psychologists need to be aware of that as, as well. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Oh, maybe just one more thing. Um, um, I was really surprised to hear some of the comments this morning about lack of coordination between the science groups. Uh, I don't think we experienced that during <coughs> our flight. And by that I mean that a lot of the PI teams got together very well and made sure that they shared um, blood, uh, urine, and uh, saliva samples amongst us. We weren't poked twice in one day. That was very good. The cardiovascular teams did a magnificent job. There's about three international teams that got together, and they shared um, ECG and Holter uh, data. Holter's a bit of a pain in the butt, and so if you can share that data, uh, that's very helpful in, in ultrasound and continuous blood pressure, so I think they did a good job on that. So uh, our experience, I think, was that um, the coordination was, was actually uh, quite good. Um, okay, maybe just one more thing. It's not on this list here. Um, we just finished our debriefs, and there was um, you know, hundreds of recommendations we passed on to the program, but the managers asked us to list our top five. And the top one of our top five uh, was that we need to improve public uh, outreach. You know, I, I, a typical public outreach event on orbit for us is to all stand in node two and uh, with our feet on the, on the designated floor and then just answer 20 minutes of questions. And we're asked the same questions over and over and over again each month. And the answers are the same as well. And the same thing in the Russian segment. In the service module, we're sent up these stilted messages to read. That's a waste of astronaut and cosmonaut time. And I think we need to follow the Japanese example and come up with more creative uh, public outreach and uh, get caught up with the 21st century um, uh, uh, media tools that are that are out there. And also I heard Barbara Morgan make a comment this morning too that we need to engage people. If you just provide literature to people about our space program and say well, aren't we wonderful, it doesn't make an impact. Uh, I think if you can engage people, get the young people to get their hands dirty, uh, I think that helps them out a lot. <coughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh, any questions? You know, uh, two important countermeasures that I think a couple of you referred to is uh, for sort of psychological uh, side of things is to see the earth and to um, be able to communicate with the ground. And I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, trip to an asteroid or to Mars where you suddenly have the earth be a insignificant dot in space. You're very autonomous in your operation because you've got a uh, maybe 30 to 40 minute round trip communication lag. You can't talk to your family. You can't get directions from the ground very easily. Uh, these are certainly empirical issues, but I'm just wondering operationally wha how if you have any ideas other than putting a telescope on board to look at the earth and maybe <coughs> doing emails where you preempt the answers <coughs> that you expect to save time. What do you all think uh, about uh, countermeasures to deal with the effects of this kind of distance, both on the not seeing the earth and <coughs> delaying talking to the ground. Uh, I'd like to throw one or two quick ideas out towards that. Uh, one of the <coughs> things that recently that we got aboard the, the uh, high tech uh, International Space Station, you know, multi billions of dollars and some of the highest technologies, we actually got the, the internet, 
on the space station. And uh, our crew didn't have it, but I think uh, later crews have. And I think that's made a difference in our ability to communicate outwards uh, with the new social media tools. But also it's a better way to be able to con uh, communicate with families nowadays. Uh, before, it used to be, you know, telephone. Uh, I hear stories of Skylab guys, you know, getting a chance to, you know, uh, have a, a black phone at the home to talk to their families or their families would have to come into mission control. On board the station, we now have telephone, uh, but uh, even if we don't have telephone because of the, the lag in turnaround time, uh, we'd still be able to chat, you know, like uh, my, my wife and I do, that's how we communicate during the day. Having those similar kind of tools on board, having a huge you know, video library already on board so we don't have to beam it up, you know, just put all these things on a hard drive. Little things like that, you say, well, you know, this is high tech, multi-million dollar spacecraft, we shouldn't have, you know, the crews are really tough, they don't need any of that stuff. But little things like that don't cost anything, really. Uh, just having the internet on board uh, was a big deal for NASA, and uh, finally we convinced them that it was a good idea, and I think it's proven itself. But uh, just having this kind of, uh, those kind of little things on board can make a difference. Just one idea. Good one. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to kind of shift a little bit and say, well, actually, I think uh, the most important part of that would be pre-flight prep, uh, getting your head wrapped around what you're about to go do. Uh, certainly, like Mike said, little things like that are, are very much appreciated and do make a difference, but really it's about expectations. If you know what you're, you're going to expect, what tools you're going to have, uh, what it's going to be like, then that's going to allow you to do your own preparation, your own mental preparation of what you're about to go do. Uh, you know, when I was about to go, when I was considering uh, after being asked if I wanted to go um, join the Expedition Corps and go fly a space station flight, you know, I thought long and hard about uh, going to live in a tin can for four months, turn in six and a half, but at the time it was four month rotations. And I also thought about the commitment that I would be making to travel back and forth to uh, Star City for the better part of three and a half years of training, and uh, most of it in, in economy class. You know, so those are, all <laughs> those are all things you have to wrap your head around and be ready to do. And, uh, you know, it's, and in the early days, they didn't have IP phones. We didn't have email, or, you know, not we the U.S., but the crews that went and flew for long durations, and they did just fine because it was a matter of managing their expectations. And I think the same thing's here. There are going to be limitations to what can be done because of hardware, uh, programmatic, and other considerations, but it's, it's really about pre-flight preparation, I think, and uh, managing expectations. Another question? I have a question about crew autonomy. There are two, possi two extremes. One is to behave like a robot, learn a lot, and do, then do what one has learned. And the other is to behave like a scientist <laughs> and <laughs> be very flexible. Now the International Space Station is considered a lab, a laboratory. So theoretically, one could also think it, uh, if it would, could be great if there would be the possibility for the astronauts to in interact with the respective scientists, discuss the intermediate results, or discuss what really did not, does not work because the experiment has been designed five years ago, and then it, it turns out it does not really work like this. So do you think it, there would be a way to improve the situation and to get quicker results and have the possibility to react directly and much, much quicker? We do that on board. Uh, I know for experiments that we've done, and I'm sure uh, my other colleagues have recently flown, we, uh, we talk to the PIs before we start the experiment. We get a refresher. Uh, we share the results uh, you know, right away with commentary and things like that. We debrief it at the end of the day. Uh, but one thing that NASA has uh, been working on that's going to help with all of that is uh, science can't be done completely on a schedule. And uh, having some uh, flexibility, which is why my crew and myself, we like to uh, do some science on the weekend because we had the flexibility to set the experiment up and we were using our own time, not you know, somebody else's time. And uh, or, you know, we'll miss our exercise period or something crazy like that. We were able to uh, work science in a flexible way to, to, so that we could get the, the highest quality data possible. So these things exist right now, and uh, I think having, uh, with six people, we do have a little bit more flexibility with our scheduling, and for some of these science experiments that can't be done, uh, you know, quite by the book and that may run into problems, I don't know of any experiment that ever works perfectly the first time, uh, that uh, having that flexibility built in <coughs> and into the entire schedule is quite important. Well, 
I don't have a question, but I just want to say that this is the most candid, pertinent uh, debrief by any group of space flyers I've ever heard. I just want to thank you. One of the teams, uh, themes that has been mentioned multiple times is the radiation risk. And uh, I will repeat a question I did to you, Leroy, and then Mike. In terms of how was your preparation and training before, during, and after the fly in terms to how to be aware of the risk of radiation, how to deal with potential radiological contingencies? How was the, the, the dosimetry uh, effectiveness in, in your fly in terms to make sure that you are comfortable with radiation doses and looking in the future what you would like to see or improve in terms of the awareness of the radiation risk for future exploration missions um, let's see radiation you know right now the state of the art as I understand it is there's not a whole lot we can do about it so it was something we were certainly aware of uh, we were briefed on it <coughs> and certainly knew that flying six and a half months was going to be uh, more radiation than a two-week shuttle flight uh, also, I used to be the backup uh, for Expedition 8 for Michael Full, and during his expedition, he experienced, they experienced a solar event, and I thought, okay, well, that's out of the way, and it won't happen to me, <laughs> but it did. You know, when we were up there, we had a solar event, and, uh, you know, it's kind of eerie. You get the call from the ground and says, okay, there's a solar event, and uh, during these times, uh, during the orbit, you need to go retreat to uh, the more heavily shielded parts of the station. And, you know, it's kind of a helpless feeling because, like, well, there's nothing we can do except go ride it out. So that's what we did. And uh, even uh, a day or two after uh, the event had passed, uh, we would notice that the radiation detectors were showing about 10 times normal background radiation. And so, you know, that's not a great feeling. Um, but, you know, what do you do? And so we kept taking our big green vitamins, which was st and probably still is the state of the art for radiation protection, <coughs> those big vitamins. Um, but, you know, the, the detectors were there to, to, operationally there was nothing we could do, but we'd, you know, look at the detectors and kind of take that in and uh, said, okay, well, I guess we'll develop my film badge when I get back and see what we have. Um, fortunately, it didn't exceed any limits, uh, so they tell me. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, clearly that is the most important thing to think about as we push farther and farther out, uh, especially as we get away from the Van Allen belts and we're exposed to more. Uh, solar events on the way to, to Mars, and that works into spacecraft design and when you're gonna, how you're going to do a safe haven and things like that. Um, but it was, I, I'd say it was just on our minds, but we knew there was not much we could do about it, and it was uh, something we thought about and accepted as a risk. Any other questions? I don't know about anybody else, but I'd be very interested in hearing a Japanese poem or a song that was <laughs> written uh, during space flight. Uh, how, how would I, perhaps a live performance would be best, but if, if we're unable to do that, is there an opportunity? Because I think this is very special. I don't think you should differentiate science and art, and we need to keep the blend of all this together, and that's my point. Yeah, I wish I had the talent in that kind of field. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a challenge for me, but it was my duty. I had to do it. And actually, the, for the poem, it's a series of uh, poems uh, starting out with a very famous uh, Japanese uh, 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 poet, Shintaro Tanigawa. He started out, and then uh, uh, on the internet or the JAXA website, uh, people could just uh, submit. The, uh, the new poem. Uh, it's called a ser ser serial series of uh, poems, and uh, one of them I, uh, uh, I was in charge to contribute uh, uh, from space. And uh, this is uh, music from the pictures of the moon um, that was already done, conducted by uh, American uh, astronaut Billy Cole Stott and Greg Shamitov, and also I was uh, part of those <coughs> people who uh, took po photographs of the moons and uh, those scientists or the uh, artist uh, uh, made into uh, to a 
a piece of music and it's uh, creating a different kind of audience and the interest in the public. Uh, so not only the science and technology, education is also very popular among all the partners of the ISS, but uh, this uh, art field is uh, something new and uh, we just uh, wanted to uh, show that. And, and in addition to that, from the art aspect, uh, uh, when I was up there, we had an uh, experiment of, uh <coughs> this time it's uh, spinning, uh <coughs> It's a, how do you call this? It's a top uh, with uh, all kinds of LED, different color of LED. And if you spin it, and if you use the high definition TV and then changing the uh, shutter speed, uh, and if you capture that uh, when the spin spinning a top is spinning with the different kind of lights, it uh, captures a <coughs> very interesting uh, zero G uh, picture or the motion picture. <coughs> and uh, that is also to create the new field of uh, art and uh, so uh, JAXA is trying to utilize that in, uh, in different kind of arts as well. Um, I, right now, there are a lot of business plans being developed that are aiming to take people with far less than two-year training cycles to uh, orbit, some <coughs> of them claim, within five years. Uh, with your experience, what kind of challenges are the people trying to start these businesses confronting and how would you recommend they proceed to maximize the value of the orbital experience that they're trying to market to people? I'm not sure if your question is about the, the training part of it or just uh, the, the business model. Well, the Russians, of course, have a pretty um, established history of, of training folks for these uh, so-called space flight participant <laughs> flights to and from the station, which last about 10 days, um, eight of them or so docked. And uh, the training period for them is about six months. And uh, it's, you know, mostly what to do in terms of take, as Bob mentioned, self-care, self-management, basically taking care of yourself uh, staying out of other people's way and don't touch these certain buttons kind of thing. <laughs> um, so I think it's a question, you know, and that's obviously uh, geared toward the novelty of space flight. You know, you're talking about a handful of folks that, that, that can afford that sort of a thing. Now, if the business model develops such that they can make it more accessible to a, gr a broader range of people, pretty soon that's going to wear off and <coughs> people will want to do something because as Koichi said, uh, and Bob also, it's, it's very important to have meaningful work to do. Um, you can only look out the window so much and take so many pictures, and after that, you know, what are you going to do? So really, after you learn how to take care of yourself, the training becomes um, what you need to do to entertain yourself. What, if you're going to do some experiments, if you're going to participate in some operations or maintenance, a lot of that has to do with the vehicle. Is the vehicle going to be ca taken care of by some caretakers and you're just there along for the ride? I think that will greatly reduce the amount of training that you have to do. So to sum up, I'd say the spectrum of training has to be tailored to meet the expectations of the activities that the person will be doing on board. And, and that's sort of something that a company could uh, sort of make a Chinese menu of, you know, if you want to do this, this is how much training you have to do. And if you only want to do that, then it's this much less. Yes, I'd like to continue with the, the uh, training issue a little bit, but more on the, the sorts of things that Koichi and Bob and the, the Mike, two Mikes were mentioning in terms of training for science experiments. And a lot of us here had experience in the space lab era when there was much more of an attempt to intensively train the crew member on an experiment and make him or her a part of the experiment team, a luxury which I'm told we can't afford in the hundreds of experiments that are being conducted on the station. I'd like your reactions to the training effectiveness and the <coughs> ability to really become involved, as Dr. Gertz has said, as an interactive member of the team based upon the uh, uh, reduced exposure to the investigators. Oh, go ahead. I, I think of another difference between the shuttle and the station program is that astronauts for a shuttle flight train for tasks. We're task-oriented. Task or for station, we're uh, oriented towards acquiring generic skills and for the simple reason that when you launch, you don't know what's going to happen three months from now. So you need to have the generic skills to be able to handle whatever um, uh, arises. 
So first of all, Larry, I would say that um, some of the training could actually be cut down pre-flight and give us the training in flight I instead because we know how to connect cables. We're very familiar with the tools that we have uh, on board and uh, you can you have confidence in us that uh, for a simple standard uh, job, we can get it, get it done. And I say that uh, because during our increment, we had uh, quite a few failures of the life support system. The oxygen generation system failed, the um, carbon dioxide removal system failed, and the toilet failed as well. Never trained specifically on, on repairing those things, but with the quality and the rapidity of the uh, procedures that were, were sent up to us, uh, we were able to, 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 to fix those things. So that, that's the first comment that I, I want to make. You can cut back on, on a lot of the training that you've uh, been giving us in, in the past because we can be trained for it on orbit. Second point to make is that if we can get more comm channels up there, more space to ground comm channels, I recommend uh, telementoring us through activities as well. When, when we're on orbit, I think Leroy was talking about some of the visual problems that we were having uh, on orbit. Again, we didn't uh, train uh, how to examine each other's eyes on orbit, but by uh, they flew up some hardware for us and by telementoring us through the first session, we acquired that skill uh, like that. So count on telementoring if we can get more comm channels as well. And the last thing to uh, talk about <coughs> is uh, onboard training or on-the-job training. When we arrived on, on orbit, we quickly realized that uh, for one of the experiments called the MDS or the mouse drawer system, it's a cage with six mice in it, uh, we only had one person that was trained to, to operate that. We could just foresee the scheduling conflict. So uh, the person that was trained for it, uh, Nicole Stott, trained me on how to, how to do it. Nicole is an excellent communicator. She's an excellent astronaut. And I learned the skills uh, on orbit. I never trained for, th for that on the ground, and I was, I was fine. So that's uh, another thing to consider as well. And then I heard an earlier comment as, as well. Uh, if we have the comm channels and the time uh, available, then uh, I think uh, interactive discussions with the crew, more crew involvement would be helpful. Yes, I can add I, may, uh, I am going to add, uh, uh, as far as the subject of training is concerned, this particular issue of crew training on board uh, uh, has been given a rather serious attention in the past. And, uh, in my flight, uh, in my experience, we have performed experiments that were delivered to the Mir station, and we were not trained to do those experiments on the ground. Um, even when seven or eight months later, we had the visiting crew uh, flying over. There was a Kazakhstan um, astro cosmonaut. He wasn't even at the, tra at the cosmonaut training center yet. That was a new experience for us as well. And we did uh, two EVAs, which were not um, provided in the original program, which were not included in the original program program. They were emergency repair of a telescope that was placed outwardly. It was the external telescope, and, and because of its uh, failure, the entire X-ray system did not work. Um, and uh, the entire operation was conducted using the radio channel, the TV channel. With um, This is a very interesting topic, and this is a very needed topic. And it is really not at all clear what happens in flight. Uh, to the same Mars that we've been talking about, because um, self-control, self-regulation, self-training is definitely necessary, and that is my opinion. Could, could I pile on for one more couple of comments? First of all, um, Bob is right, and we do seem to feel this shortage about the comm channels, and just so everybody can put it in their mind, we, we will have four comp channels here shortly, so that problem technically is solved. Um, I also wanted to agree that we, we do, in my opinion, far too much payload training that's redundant. Uh, you know, most every payload has to go through um, an SSC, a computer, as Bob mentioned, and everyone will tell you how to, or, or a payload computer, and everyone will tell you how to boot the computer, and, you know, frankly, when I was on board, uh, I was doing a procedure, and um, 
you know, if you can read a procedure, you can pretty much follow it, it unless it's really something you've never ever seen before. And I had forgot that I had been trained on this particular procedure because it's generally a long time before you launch. You do it once during your increment and, and really you can read it the first time and not need to go through that. So I would agree with uh, Bob on that. Th what I wanted to really point out though is the reason that that is is that the payloads that we do are sort of dumbed down to the lowest common denominator, which is us. And, um, and you know, perhaps there's no way around that, but I've thought for a while that when we really start talking about meaningful science and having scientific thought uh, involved, um, unless you can do it telerobotically, which is, you know, maybe the answer, we need to start – uh, being able to get the community, and perhaps that's you folks, to lean on us to make these uh, experiments a little bit more complicated rather than uh, sort of shake and bake, which is kind of what they are now, where you just follow a procedure and you do a sequence of button pushes. And I'm simplifying a bit, but in general, my sense uh, is that they've b they are so simplified that you by necessity or, or by that process have limited the output, the kinds of results that you can get. So if you have talented people up there who might be, let's say a chemical engineer or somebody, uh, a physicist or somebody that has expertise in a given area, perhaps we can exploit that knowledge and use some of that expertise to try to expand the envelope of the payloads that we're doing instead of making something that is uh, so simplified because the operator is assumed to be, you know, not that bright and able to pilot science, for lack of a better word. Um, I, I think that would do the community at large uh, a great benefit. Uh, Mr. Abbey, can, can I pursue that for just a moment? Hmm? Let me, can I pursue the point that Michael <coughs> was make, making quick, yeah, sure. quickly? Very quickly. That's, that's exactly what many of us would like to, like to see, is to have <laughs> on board someone who is a member of our own experiment team. We had wonderful success with one of our own graduate students doing an experiment. Somebody who's willing to say, isn't that interesting? Maybe we should explore that. Maybe we should redo that test. Who was as familiar with it as, so, as somebody who was a member of your own laboratory. Uh, and would get the encouragement on the part of the system to use his or her scientific ex ex expertise. The other extreme, of course, as we all know, is don't vi violate rule number one, which is don't mess up. Right? <laughs> Maybe we should allow people a little bit more, fr uh, allow crew members more with more training, more freedom to become science members. We have time for one more question, Roberto. Now, first of all, thanks for organizing this session, which is really fantastic. But uh, I take the opportunity, I cannot resist the curiosity, given all your experience. Uh, imagine for a moment that going to Mars has no limiting radiation and can be done with existing technology, but it's still three years of duration, okay? So a very long uh, shot from the six months of, uh, of a space station right now. So according to the existing knowledge you have, uh, could you, I mean, which would be the right crew and are we, r are we ready to send somebody three years in space? I'd go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if, if we pretend that the radiation isn't going to hurt us, uh, like Leroy said, it, it's our expectations. If we know that it's going to be three years and we set our minds to it, then uh, three years is a long time, yeah. And uh, you have to make sure your family is, is uh, ready for this also, and uh, your friends and your, your whole life. But uh, what, a, what a wonderful expedition uh, to go on. I think uh, we've proven through our Russian colleagues and through our countermeasures, except for radiation perhaps, uh, we're ready to, uh, to go longer than six months. We haven't found her. Well, I think uh, more people the better. If we're going to go that long, maybe it's uh, six or seven people. International crew, I think. <coughs> Well, thank you all for uh, a very great discussion. I think uh, I'll echo what uh, they all said. I think they, uh, they all raised some uh, very, uh, very excellent points and ones that uh, should be considered uh, by, uh, by us all. So thank you all. I wouldn't.
consists of having the big ones paying now for Robert, I call the big ones going, looking, and uh, we have several bunches to explore. Like, for example, before, uh, before everybody leaves, let me try to explain the groups. Uh, first, uh, you know, there are three groups this afternoon. Uh, and uh, on the back of your badge is a letter. And that letter uh, is the group to which you're assigned. Uh, and now everybody, uh, and we would appreciate, to everybody, we'd really appreciate your help and support here. Uh, it's always awkward to try to decide and choose which group and so on. Uh, and we've tried to keep the groups relatively balanced. Now group A is going to meet in this room. So you don't have to go anywhere. Group B is uh, going to meet uh, in the third floor conference room. It's a very nice, very well equipped and comfortable conference room. Uh, and Group C is going to meet, I think it's in 112 on this level. It's over here in the corner of the first floor as you go out the big room. 10 what? 102. 102. And uh, you have the rest of the afternoon, dinner. Uh, oh, there's one thing. Between, between 5 and 6, please understand that they'll be setting up the dining room uh, so that you have to be elsewhere in the building. Uh, it might be a nice time to look around some of the upper floors. Uh, and then we'll convene back again at... Uh, I guess it's at six, six o'clock, six thirty. Let me see. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it must be six, six thirty. I think it's six thirty. Yes. Where'd he go? Yes. It was, wasn't it? I know. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'll see y'all later.